and uh, welcome to today's meeting in the Free Press Society, the first meeting in 2008. And a special welcome to you, Kim Hitchens. We are very happy to host one of Britain's most high profile conservative voices today. If you don't know, but if you don't know, Peter Hitchens writes a weekly column in May on Sunday and has written several books, among others, this book. Some of you have read it. I have. And it, um, in the book, you can, among many other things, read an interesting critique of the totalitarian intolerance of the new atheists, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, which whom Peter yeah. Hitchens know pers personally very well. Yeah. Um, you told me, Peter, that you have lived abroad uh, as a foreign correspondent in Russia, in, I think you've spent time in, in Germany as well, but you've never been to Denmark before. This is your very first visit here, and I hope that we tonight can prove that this is not Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, uh, consists of mentally gap between Denmark, Sweden, Copenhagen and Manu. <laughs> Today's topic is dark liberty and the future of Europe. And we are very much looking forward to hearing your speech. But before I leave the, word, the floor to you, just a few words about today's <coughs> program. I think you will speak on 40, 45 minutes? Ages. <laughs> Ages. <laughs> and then we'll have a break. We'll need one. And we can you can, you can have a cup of coffee or buy a glass of wine or beer next door. No, in this room. And then after a short break we'll meet again for questions and comments and debate. And that was all. Now I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you, Katrina. She didn't say how very hard I tried to persuade her not to invite me in how many efforts I made. <laughs> For which I now apologize, though who knows if I may have been right. I'm also impressed that so many people have turned out for what must promise to be an evening of unrelenting pessimism. <laughs> Which is what you go and get, I'm beautifully symbolized by what appears to be a painting of people kicking each other in the head <laughs> on the ceiling. Um, the actual title that I was asked to, to, um, to speak to was not God, Liberty and the Future of Europe, but God, Liberty and the Worrying Future of Europe, which is even worse. Uh, but I was also warned by Katrina that uh, I should speak for as long as possible so I could prevent you lot from saying too much. <laughs> which is why I have here this Fidel Castro style of which I shall now begin. And first, I must thank you so much for inviting me to this beautiful maritime city, crammed with beauty and with history. And on that point, I am well aware that Britain's contribution to that history has not always been called <laughs> My countrymen, including our national hero, Admiral Horatio Nelson, have an unpleasant habit of doing great damage and destruction whenever they come here. I'm hoping that I shan't be repeating any of that, but I you should try very hard not to. We have also, we British, done that dreadful thing which we habitually do to friendly nations on the continent. We have pledged to come to your aid against the Germans in time of trouble. Given the way this worked out for Belgium in 1914, almost totally occupied and plundered for four long years, and Poland in 1939, wiped off the map and subsequently moved bodily westward by 100 miles and subjected to 40 years of communist oppression, I think you should be grateful we didn't come to the in 1864 and that Lord Palmerston blatantly broke his promises. And we British did not, in fact, save you from the Prussians. I would much rather be a betrayed Dane of 1864 than a saved Belgian of 1914, or let alone a saved Pole of 1939. But in general, my country's history, protected by a few short but rough miles of salt sea, has given it a snobbish and scornful view of less happy lands. 
please forgive me if I show any traces of this in what I say about the current state of Europe. It is unintentional, but perhaps unavoidable. In my view, we in Britain praise our own courage and resolve far too much and give thanks for the sea far too little. Of course, you may also need a navy to make full use of the sea's defences, but we have now so forgotten our history that we have scrapped most of ours. Who knows what terrible things we might have undergone and what terrible things we might yet undergo uh, had we not been saved from trouble by the English Channel and particularly in the future with no navy, what lies ahead of us. Mr. Churchill did a brave and right thing when he refused to negotiate with Germany in 1940 and instead threw himself on the interesting mercy of the United States of America. But without the sea, he would not have had the choice. That's it, as far as Churchillian bombast is going to go this evening. I'm as patriotic as most Englishmen and more patriotic than many, but I must warn you that if you are hoping for any sort of Churchillian rallying cry against the new menaces that face us tonight, you're in for a disappointment. I have largely given up direct engagement in politics. British politics, I have found, is entirely tribal and wholly hostile to reason. In fact, it is angered by reason and closes its mind to such reason with a self-righteous certainty, which is horrible to see. That is why I personally abandoned direct political activity and declared myself to be what I now am, the obituarist of my country. <laughs> there I was, a national newspaper columnist, with an enviable access to a large number of minds. And I could do nothing, absolutely nothing, to avoid the perils or halt the follies which I could clearly see and describe and for which there were straightforward remedies available. In the past few years, I've found it harder and harder to maintain any political stance at all and cannot really offer you any comfort or encouragement of that sort this evening. In fact, the most cheerful prospect I can offer you is the possibility that I may be wrong. <laughs> I am sure that you will both think and hope that I am wrong, especially by the end of this evening. Paradoxically, I am personally much happier since I found I could do nothing. A huge and troubling responsibility has fallen from my shoulders. And I found a great deal of personal comfort in the consolations of the Christian religion and the glorious expression of it in poetry painting, music, and architecture, so much of which still survives despite the terrible century through which it has passed. But politically, Christianity offers me little. After all, what is actually left of Christianity in our culture? In Britain, there is little sign that the clergy believe in God. Let alone anybody else. The arches which hold up our civilization were made to Christian designs and built around Christian frames. But they will stand now for only so long as they continue to be stronger than the malicious power of gravity and decay pushing down upon them. They are not being renewed or repaired. The forces which raise them no longer exist. It is the oddest paradox of our time the governments of formerly Christian Western nations, when they seek to rouse their populations to war, attack Islamist movements, whether the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, or Daesh, because they allegedly, or maybe in fact, hate our way of life. Ladies and gentlemen, I also hate our way of life. <laughs> Often for reasons alarmingly similar to the passions of Muslims. I loathe the destruction of marriage and the family, the coarseness and immodesty of our culture, and the widespread indifference to, sometimes fanned into scorn for, the idea that we owe anything to God. Yet I'm also alarmed by the arrival of Islam in our societies, mainly through large-scale immigration, encouraged by the very same politicians who say these things about how Muslims hate our way of life. The arrival of Islam is a major moral and cultural force in Britain and large parts of Europe because of the mass immigration which our elites have, not in my view, not merely not failed to resist, but have actively encouraged. How did Christianity, which was in these times 
to be our most reliable defense against this problem crumble so fast. How did Christian Europe fail so totally? For fail, it certainly did. In my father's early childhood, before 1914, Christianity was as essential to English life as, say, good broadband is now. I suspect it was much the same here. Now it is an eccentricity. For me, Europe had a moment of choice in 1914. As Germany sought a swift, decisive victory in its cynical war against Russia, a war which had been planned for years and carefully provoked, the populations of the great powers went collectively mad. They rushed enthusiastically into a conflict they were falsely told was a great war for civilization. These are the actual words inscribed on my great uncle Harry's medal, identical to those given to millions in 1918. He was at what we in Britain called the Battle of Jutland in 1916, by the way. My late father's equivalent medal, partly his reward for being at the Battle of North Cape in 1943, finally arrived in a plastic box last year, 73 years after that battle and 30 years after my father died. Uh, but you can never, ever beat British bureaucracy in its slowness <laughs> and awarding courage and resolution. It doesn't say anything about a great war for civilization. Perhaps because of the awkward problem that an alliance with Joseph Stalin couldn't really be a war for civilization as such. It is even quite awkward to try to describe it as a war against barbarism, so there are no words. And just a depiction of the British lion trampling on German eagle, as I remember. <laughs> The churches, for the most part, endorsed the 1914 war as a modern crusade. And so, with some noble exceptions, did the social democratic parties of Europe, who, in my view, were the other great moralistic and idealistic force of the pre-1914 continent. Now it seems to me almost entirely gone. Pagan patriots, such as the English poet Rupert Brooke, with his ghastly verses about, I'm going to read this because it's so awful, now, God be thanked, who has matched us with his power, and brought our youth and wakened us from sleeping with hand made sure, clear eye, and sharpened power to turn as swimmers into cleanness leaping. Yes, he actually wrote that in 1914 about the coming war. Only people such as Reuben Brooke, who I believe to be a pagan in this matter, welcomed the conflict more consistently. And what God, I wonder, was he thanking in those verses? Those who had to fight quickly saw the truth. Rats devouring the corpses of their comrades within feet of where they ate their meals. The absolute corruption and destruction of all the gentle morals that they'd been taught in their Victorian and Edwardian upbringings. A total end of civilization as such surrounding them. And at Christmas 1914, Christian Europe flickered into flame for the last time, in my view, when British and German soldiers, reminded of their common Christianity by the hymns of the Nativity, climbed from their trenches and embraced each other. An event which still seems to me to be one of the greatest historical events of all time. They should then have walked home, all of them, in an unstoppable mass rejection of folly, and so saved Europe from what was to come, which was, of course, Lenin, Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin. But they did not, and the 20th century turned out as it did instead. And when the illusion that the 1914 war was a great war for civilization collapsed in the great nations, and when the horrible cost of the war in death, maimings, bereavement, headless families, and general demoralization became clear, the churches, along with all other instruments of moral authority from the former society of the European nations, <coughs> began to shrivel. They also, I believe, shriveled in the neutral nations, <coughs> untouched as they were by the war, because it was so vast and so unavoidable and so total that all Europe felt it, and all European empires. Only the USA, strangely enough, was immune from it. Stefan Zweig's account of pre-1914 Vienna, which many of you will have read in his book, The World of Yesterday, is 
strenuously critical of the era which he describes. He depicts this period as a stifling and stuffy time of repression and rigid education in which the young fell under the rule of the old. And I have no doubt there is a great deal of truth in what he says. My own childhood still had echoes of the same thing, but is he not also an unreliable narrator? This was a world in which, for instance, violence and open lust were shocking. And displays of bad manners and drunkenness a scandal. People actually found them physically distressing. No doubt all of us in this room would regard such a society as oppressive, even repressive. Radicals would also point out that beyond the borders of the middle class, <laughs> violence and lust and drunkenness were very much present. And yet this was an example of human self-restraint, individual self-government, the placing of chains upon one's own desires, as urged by Edmund Burke, as the alternative to having them placed upon us by the state. I've learned over many years that there is no utopia, that one must choose between options which are unattractive in different ways. In the end, I prefer the restrained and stifling society of self-control, as described by Spike, to the explosion of what I call selfism, the pursuit of total personal autonomy which first stirred in the pre-1914 era, but grew in strength in the disillusioned landscape of post-1919 Europe, and now, to a great extent, rules us all. Why did Christianity fail what may have been its greatest test? I think it was, in fact, much weaker than it looked in 1914. It had been corrupted by its own success. For Christian societies, especially in my view, Protestant ones, bring material well-being <coughs> to those who embraced their spiritual comforts. John Wesley, the man who re-Christianized a largely godless England in the 18th century, and so made the Victorian era possible, knew that where Christianity succeeds, it can also prepare its own destruction. He wondered if true scriptural Christianity has a tendency, in process of time, to undermine and destroy itself. For wherever true Christianity spreads, it must cause diligence and frugality which in the natural course of things must beget riches. And riches naturally beget pride, love of the world, and every temper that is destructive of Christianity. And I think this is true. The proud tower, which was pre-1914 Europe, was a tower of gold. And it was that which made it heedless of its moral fate. Of course, by our standards, it was in many ways materially poor. But by those of all the previous centuries, it was extraordinarily rich. And here is the interesting thing. This age of riches is now coming to an end. Through two, though, though two catastrophic wars have destroyed pre-1914 Europe's moral codes, devalued its education, swept away much of its sense of place and permanence, reduced to rubble a great part of its art and architecture, churned up its landscape and transformed its music. And just as a, as a side thought here, will we ever grasp just how important music is to civilization? And has there ever been a better illustration of this than the era of rock, in which the thump and twang and howl of Mick Jagger has defined a whole moral, or perhaps you could say immoral universe, in total opposition to, say, Bach or Palestrina? Has there ever been such a and yet we let it pass almost unnoticed in our daily lives. They have, in the end, all these changes delivered a superficial prosperity. People have plenty of stuff. They have plenty to eat. Even the poor are rich by the standards of 1914, <coughs> and rich also by the standards of Africa today. You have to go a long way east in Europe now to find anything resembling the policy of the era before the Great War in cities or in countryside. <clears throat> or so it has been. At the end of the Cold War, the end of the division of Europe, which actually suited the Western half rather well, rather better than it ever admitted, happens <coughs> that. We made a devil's bargain. 
with Stalin at Yalta for peace and prosperity and firmly closed the border with the East in return for giving him absolute power over the people unlucky enough to dwell in his defensive zone. We may not have liked the Prague Putsch or the Slatsky trials or the crushing of the Berlin Workers' Revolt or the flattening of the Hungarian Revolution or the extinction of the 1968 Prague Spring or the Polish state of emergency, but we let them happen. We made it embarrassingly clear that despite our claims of having fought Hitler because he was wicked, our love for democracy, freedom and truth was in fact an internal complacent one. I'm sure this hypocrisy, which was seldom admitted at the time and is seldom admitted now, made us even more demoralized in the true sense of the word than we were before. Here I speak most directly of my own country, though I believe similar things are happening elsewhere in Western Europe and the USA. Real poverty is now slipping back into our lives. Welfare states wither under the pressure of inflation, which is targeted on those without assets, and so understated in fiscal measures. Governments are less and less able to meet their obligations through taxation, yet are afraid to reduce these obligations and resort to dangerous levels of inflationary borrowing instead. Devalued educational qualifications guarantee nothing. Job security vanishes. Pensions become unaffordable. Governments, while refusing to admit this is what they're doing, and either claiming that the migrants are refugees or pretending to try to control migration, or both, encourage mass movement of people to create cheap labor to keep wages low and leave their indigenous poor to cope with the resulting strain on housing, education, healthcare, transport, and social services. But in my country, this is an even bigger problem. My country also encourages immigration because without it, much of the unskilled work of our society would simply not be done. Listen to this list of British government mistakes. An egalitarian dogma which has destroyed education for the poor. A welfare system that refuses to distinguish between the deserving and the <coughs> undeserving. De facto legalization of marijuana the abandonment of any controls on alcohol, a selfish destruction of lifelong marriage, fatherhood, and family life. Just a few examples. There are others I could come up with given the time. These have produced a huge new layer of ill-educated and tragically unemployable people who cannot reasonably be expected to do any work. And they do not. And those migrants who do the cheap labor are, as always, pitiable in their exploited ignorance. But many of them are also amazed in my country at the strange inability and unwillingness of local young men and women to do the work they have come to do, and by the inability of the host country to enforce its borders and its migration rules. I've observed this. I know it to be true. It has happened to Britain. It may have happened to you but it certainly has happened to Britain. It's in the past. It's not about to happen. You may protest against it in Britain if you wish, but it will do you no good. And the Christian has another problem. He absolutely must do what he or she can to try to make this mess work. We didn't choose this. I think it was a grave mistake, but it would be a still graver mistake to do anything which might make it worse. This is one of the problems with Christianity. Its adherents are quite simply prevented from taking certain sorts of political actions, especially any which might reasonably be expected to lead to cruelty or persecution. The people who have come among us are here. We must be kind to them. But the liberals and the open borders and the open services are not pleased with or happy to apply the necessary second half of this proposition. This is yours and mine, Europe as a whole, a Christian society from its foundations up. Though, as I pointed out earlier, it will only remain so for a short while as things are. Those who come to live in it should be expected to accept this in practice. Like any other guest in another's house, they should adapt to the rules of the house, not demand that the house changes its rules to suit them. 
but alas, the terrible problem of our age then reappears. Our societies are attracted to migrants and agreeable in many ways because they used to be Christian. They will continue to be so for a few years yet, as Christian habits and thought take some time to die out. So the migrants, paradoxically, have come here for benefits which their own arrival, unless they are encouraged to integrate, will help to dilute and destroy. But who will encourage them to integrate? Our governments no longer believe in any of the principles on which our societies are based. They believe instead in a subjective and largely meaningless thing called human rights. Old-fashioned political conservatism in European and American societies has almost completely disappeared. It has been replaced by an aggressive Thatcherism or Reaganism, always indifferent to and often quite hostile to the marriage-based deferred gratification morality of social conservatism. Among the strongest supporters, for instance, of marijuana decriminalization in Britain is a body called the Adam Smith Institute, which dares to name itself after that great communist. It is crowned with keen young Thatcherites. It constantly produces material calling for the legalization of marijuana. I have renamed it the Adam Spliff Institute. <laughs> <laughs> it would not be particularly unhappy with this. The Cato Institute in the United States takes a similar view of this particular aspect of selfism or libertarianism as this strand of thought boastfully, and in my view, moronically calls itself. Many of those, and in this I, I rather include the Murdoch media, who claim to be disturbed by the arrival of large numbers of Muslims and Islamists, are also keen supporters of the open borders, which this libertarianism favours. The backers of anti-extremist school programmes, the powerful secret police, of overpowering security services to track terrorists, the friends of the surveillance and identity card state, are the same people as the ones who say that they want open borders. And worse yet, they are the same as the ones who have repeatedly supported crazed wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and Syria, which have stimulated so much of the movement of people <clears throat> which we now face. Then there is a very strange transformation of the left, the left to which I used to belong. Old-fashioned social democrats were often highly socially conservative, because so were their voters. And their voters were highly socially conservative because they knew very well the value of social conservatism for a good life and an honest place if you weren't rich enough to buy your way out of crime and trouble and chaos. They were in favor of marriage, of disciplined education, of properly enforced laws. Who suffers worse from disorder and crime? The working poor, of course. They were often straightforwardly patriotic and almost invariably suspicious <coughs> of large scale immigration. Who speaks for them now? In Britain, much of the Labour Party began among Methodists, Christians, very serious Christians, who followed the social gospel of the same John Wesley I mentioned earlier. Yet there is now absolutely no sign of this once huge political force in the British Parliament. Only a last faint echo of it in the large Labour vote for leaving the European Union at our referendum last year, which actually swung the result. The old Marxist left have become Euro-communists, cultural revolutionaries, uninterested in the working class, and are reconciled to the continued existence of capital, provided they can regulate it. Capital, in turn, is uninterested in conservatism and is happy to cooperate in political correctness of all kinds, which suits its desire for an unlimited supply of cheap and pliable labor. How shall we in the West now compete with the sweatshops of Shanghai and Canton? Why? By driving mothers out of the home and into the workforce, and by flinging wide our borders to all we can, so that we too can have sweatshops here in Canton in London too. Meanwhile, China has proved once and for all that you can have prosperity and economic growth of a kind without political and intellectual freedom. The great hope of the 1990s at the end of Chinese communism and 
the arrival of prosperity of capitalism in that country would bring freedom has been one of the most, most totally broken of our time. Is all this because we have tacitly accepted that the future will look far more like China, a country which, for some reason, few yet have come around to fearing, that then it will look like America, of which we increasingly despair. Is it possible that we spend so much energy on attacking repression in Russia, a country we are not truly afraid of, if we have any sense, and which is no real threat to us, but serves as a used bogeyman into which to deflect our shame and bind to the real menaces of China and Saudi Arabia? I sometimes wonder whether this is the reason for this curious form of madness. In many ways, the new world before us looks worryingly like the weird joint child of Margaret Thatcher, Timothy Leary, and Deng Xiaoping. Its loins free, its economy liberated, while its drug mind is set on passivity and pleasure, and regulated by internet conformism. It all begins to resemble Aldous Huxley's brain in the world, the most accurate dystopian prediction of them all, far surpassing Orwell. Who needs thought police when people have come to love their own servitude? In this century, the philosophers have so far changed the world. Now, it seems to me, the point is to understand it. <laughs> I have sought, seeming to explain, how my own preoccupations with the abolition of history, the destruction of religion, the use of legal and illegal drugs to create passivity, the failure of conservatism to combat or reverse cultural and moral revolution, the crises of interventionist war and mass immigration, have a common thread. I am, however, too lucky. I was privileged to see the end of the previous civilization. I am not uncritical of it. And I know very well that it is dead and gone. The past will not come back. But I also know that it possessed virtues which have entirely vanished from the world we now live in. And it is perhaps because I can see no way of restoring those virtues that, like Rod Dreher, I feel forced by my own thoughts into a retreat from combat. I can easily imagine finding some island or mountain fastness and hiding there until the storms are over, trying to keep a feeble flame of enlightenment alive. To fight the monsters and dragons of the new world, you need a belief, not just that the present is all wrong, I can help you with that, but that the future might be better. That, I'm afraid, I have to leave you tired on your own. Now we are starting um, again, and you are, it's possible to ask questions or make comments, and we look for a good debate. And I think. Anybody? Yeah. yeah, please stand, please stand. Thank you so much for your speech. Um, you left us with a concluding word about belief, belief in a better future. As a Christian, don't you think that Christians are the hope for the future? Because as a Christian, you would have to believe in hope, or at least you have to, to promote hope. So don't you think that, that there is something that is worth fighting for as a Christian in your church? The question is about hope <laughs> and about whether Christians should, should, are obliged to be hopeful. Uh, well, yes, they are, but not, it seems to me, in a material or temporal way. And I think that is the difficulty. What we have done, because of the, the John Wesley point that I, that I made in in my earlier remarks, because for so long, Christianity and its practice was rewarded by material things and by a society which continued apparently to improve and move upwards towards a shining future, we may have confused the two. The Christian is obliged to hope when material hope and temporal hope 
have all gone. The sin against, the sin of despair, is not a sin of despair because the, the crime rate has gone up and there's nothing in the shops. It's a sin of despair about the universe. And I genuinely think that Christian hope is, is, is not a utopian hope or a material hope or a temporal one, but an internal one, which you are obliged, and most of us, I hope, will never undergo this test. I certainly don't want to undergo it. You are obliged to maintain, even in the blackest of circumstances, uh, which we are not yet in. So, no, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think it's the same thing. It would be nice. It, I, I think that sometimes there is a... One, one of the 19th century popes used the expression satanic optimism uh, to describe, and I think quite correctly, to describe the, the, the idea of endless material progress which had taken hold of European society towards the end of the 19th century. Uh, some of you will, will have read the, the rather fine English novel, The Go-Between, by L.P. Hartley. But one of the points in that book is the belief that people had in the year 1900 that they were at the beginning of a century of endless hope, goodness, and improvement. And of course, the, the part of the many messages of the novel is that they were completely and utterly wrong about what was to come. I think you have to separate material hope from, uh, from eternal hope. And uh, very much, I think, you have, to, you, you have to set your face against any form <coughs> of material utopianism. U utopia can only be approached across a sea of blood and you never arrive. Yeah, uh, now? What's your view on London having a Muslim mayor? <laughs> What's the long-term effect of that, do you think? I am um, troubled by it. I think it, in many ways it's a good thing that it demonstrates that we are a society which is quite capable of absorbing, welcoming and bringing into the centre of our political life people of a, of, of a belief which 30 or 40 years ago would have been considered wholly alien. I think that it would be very good if, in general, societies which had large Muslim populations did as much as they conceivably could to integrate Muslims into a Christian society. I think it would be idle and probably foolish to start saying, as Christians, let's try and proselytize among Muslims, who, as we all know, have an extreme difficulty in converting from their religion to any other because of the penalties uh, which are imposed on them for doing so. But on the other hand, I don't think that it would be at all impossible to say that if we made it plain to them that we were prepared to welcome them into our society as much as we did by electing a Muslim mayor in the city of London, uh, that perhaps the, how shall I put it, the potential hostility between the religions could be disarmed. I, I, again, I think that you, if you'd asked me 40 years ago, would I want Britain to have a large Muslim population, I would have said an unhesitating no. And if you ask me now, do I like the precepts of Islam, I would say no, I do not like many of the precepts of Islam, though some of them are, are attractive to me and attractive to all of us when examined and visit Muslim societies and see them in action, and you will find attractive things in them. That's not the point. The point is, if people of a different belief are living in do we increase the likelihood of bringing them around to our point of view by hostility uh, or by the other thing? And I have to say, I think that the only Christian response is, is, is not hostility. So no, I don't, I, I, it, it, I, I regret the events which have led to the fact that we have a large Muslim population, which is not a policy I would ever have advised. But as it has happened, I am glad we have a Muslim mayor of London. Uh, Lars? Yes. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Jews. Uh, I don't quite believe you uh, when you say that you've lost all hope and that you are now the chronicler of uh, your uh, society's downfall. What makes you do that? Why don't you just uh, serve some hashish uh, in the wilderness and relax? Why do you participate in public debate when you think it's hopeless? Uh, I, I, there's no way out of it. That's my question. Okay, no, I got the question. It, some, to some extent, it's a rerun of the first question, uh, because it, it, it's a question of what one would define as hope. I think, and I do ask myself the very same thing quite often. First of all, I, I enjoy writing. Oh, yes. 
It is a pleasure to me, and, it's, and, uh, and I, I enjoy meeting people who've read what I've written, and I enjoy knowing that people have read what I've written, and that is a pleasure in itself, entirely self-contained, which I don't deny. I'm as selfish as the next man, and feel more selfish than some people, so that's true. So it would be, it, it's an enjoyable occupation. Uh, it's, it's also absolutely true to say that when I shook off the responsibility of believing that I might change anything, I did feel personally happy. I was no longer, I won't say tormented, but troubled by the fact that there was something I wished to do which I, which I, couldn't, which I couldn't do. Because once th that thing becomes impossible in your mind, there's no longer any point in making yourself unhappy doing it. But the other thing, above all things, which I think you might believe, is that I, I, and your, your, first, your, your first remark that you don't think I'm saying the truth, I think, Telling the truth is an absolute duty in itself, a moral act which has virtue of itself, even if it has no effect, it's worth doing. And I think that what I do is, is to tell the truth about what is happening and how it happened. And if there is any value in it beyond the intrinsic value that truth is itself good, it is that maybe in future, somebody else in possession of a prosperous, happy, civilized, free country, will look at what they have and not then devise in a few short years a series of moronic plans to destroy it utterly, as we have done. It might be a useful instruction to someone in the future not to make the mistakes that we made. So no, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that your rejection stand. Okay, uh, I just had the privilege of shaking your hand and thank you for being here today. Um, even and, and last, just ask you about uh, your hope for the future, and I actually want to um, elaborate on that a little bit. So originally, I'm from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I came to Denmark as a as a three year old. Uh, I fell into the new atheist trap, which your brother largely contributed to writing, and I God later on. Him. Sorry. God bless him. Yeah, God bless him. <laughs> uh, I later on stumbled upon the likes of G.K. Chesterton and. C.S. Lewis and St. Augustine, and today I'm, I'm a Christian. Uh, my family is, you know, nominally Muslim, and um, I'm a Bosniak of ethnicity, but I live in Copenhagen. I've spent uh, most of my life in Copenhagen. I today try to persuade ethnic Danes about the uh, magnificent cultural heritage they have in this country and the superiority of their culture compared to many other cultures uh, from afar. Uh, but I, I was born in Yugoslavia, Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, and as with a lot of the Eastern Bloc, those countries used to be largely atheistic and communist. And you look at a country like uh, Poland today or uh, Russia today, uh, they're very Christian. And it seems, I mean, if, if you would have looked at those countries uh, under Stalin, you, you would never have said that they would go with icons you know, into space today, right? Or when you look at South Korea, having 30% uh, of its population uh, being uh, Christian today, I think 20 something percent is Protestant, 7 percent uh, Catholic, and so on. Uh, so, what do you think about the thesis of, of Christianity sort of dying in, in Western Europe, but then only to emerge from the ashes with the help from the rest of the world? Well, I think it's very possible. Uh, Christianity in Africa is also prospering greatly, or so I'm told. Uh, but I, that wasn't, I wasn't trying to give a, an estimation of the survival of Christianity as such. As I was really uh, commenting on its, what seems to me to be its death wish uh, and, uh, and rapidly approaching end in, in, in Europe. Uh, your, your point about Russia, I wouldn't entirely agree with. Uh, Russia, in Russia, the Christian religion was terribly persecuted violently stamped out, but uh, remained partly alive because of the persecution and was also given a, a brief period uh, of restoration to life during the Second World War when Stalin called upon it to save him uh, from the German invasion, which it, in many ways I believe it did. In Poland, the national identification between the Roman Catholic religion Polish patriotism was total. I'm not at all sure whether the post-1989 Polish state is, is anything like as Catholic as the pre-1989 one. 
In fact, I, my estimation is, and that people who've been there more recently than I have might have other views on this, my estimation is that Poland is becoming more secular uh, as, it, as it becomes more prosperous and more westernized. And these are complicated equations. They vary in different places. And your own, you, I think you have to admit that your own uh, experience has possibly not been all that common. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, so a, I'm an honor I, anomaly. You, I mean, you might yeah. Yeah. possibly be extrapolating more than you sure. really are able but to. I'm thinking of the, the rise of Christianity in, in, in China, for example. And when you think about historically how Christianity has been persecuted throughout the Roman Empire, and despite all of that, it's, it's growth. Well, maybe oh, what China, China, the, 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 who can say? Maybe what Christianity in Western Europe means is a period of persecution, but I'm not going to stand up here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. My name is Ole Bergström. Thank you yeah. for talking about Britain and Christianity. Now we came here to Denmark, and you know, Danes, they are heathens and atheists. And they are run by one thing called uh, reason or rationality, something like that. I think that is deeply founded in the Danes, and they, 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 that's the only philosophy you could have. And uh, I would say the same was, uh, could, would be the case for the Swedes, our neighboring <coughs> country over there. But then we see recently, you know, they're being taken over by the Muslims for the moment, and then they have you know, their politicians there, they are mad. Uh, they are developing this called this sexism. You have to consider personally: am I a femini feminist? Am I a masculinist? Or something quite different? And so the, the, the Swedish government recently decided they're going to have a feminist foreign policy, <laughs> feminist army, etc. And, and here, a couple of days ago, they declared that now our big enemy is Putin. And every household has to have food for seven days if Russian tax should come. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what could It'd be buying a lot of sardines. <laughs> <laughs> so, if we wouldn't it be a progress if we could roll the Swedes back to rationality? I, uh, th there are some tasks oh. which are beyond me. There is, there, there, there is no conflict between faith and reason as far as I'm concerned. In fact, the, the Church of England, to which I have the dubious honor of belonging, has always believed in a, in a tripod of, of faith, reason, and tradition, and scripture, scripture, reason, and tradition. Uh, and I don't see, a, a, I've never seen any conflict between reason and religious faith. Uh, but what we have at the moment uh, in the prosperous, formerly social democratic, what I tend to think of as city-states, really, of the, of the Scandinavian region, is the end of something. It's an idea which has, has, has reached its, its limits in terms of creating the most elaborate possible welfare state, the most liberal possible policies, and now doesn't, finds it imperfect, and doesn't know what to do. Uh, I can't, I can't prescribe for Swedish government. Uh, I'm a, I, uh, the only point that you would that you raised that I wouldn't comment on in any detail is the Russian panic, uh, which yeah. seems to me to be virgin. Now, I don't like to use these terms. I don't like to use Freud in this political debate. It seems to be verging <laughs> on mental illness uh, in, in which the Western nations find themselves. Russia has <coughs> gross domestic products of Italy. It does not present a threat. To, the, uh, to, 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 to Western Europe in any way. And the spreading of the idea that it does seems to me to be a very, very curious feature of, our, of, of modern life. I, I tried to some extent to explain it. It's a, it's a, displaced, uh, a displaced fear about real threats to us, which we prefer not to think about. But I, I do find it very worrying that it is so common. And I am, although I laugh at it, and although I think it absurd, I do sometimes wonder whether it might not bring us into another European war if people can't be awoken to it. But I, I, other than that, if you want me to go and reform Sweden, I think you would um, <laughs> someone else. I'm not prepared to try. I have my limits. <laughs> Uh, the moral compass of Christianity. 
Um, and I'm not a Christian myself, but as far as I understand, Christianity is very centered around love and love thy neighbor and all this. Yeah. Where is the center of that? Yeah. <laughs> it's over. It's over. Yeah. I, I <laughs> and I was just wondering how you reconcile this with your focus on refusal to accept refugees of war torn countries. How do you, yeah, how do you reconcile those two ideas of love thy neighbor? I'm with you. I have. I have. I have. Um, you mentioned uh, the word refugees. <coughs> Refugees, why refugees has a specific meaning is somebody fleeing from danger or persecution into another country. None of the people who arrive in Western Europe is a refugee. They have all passed through countries where they were safe from danger and persecution. Yeah. What they are, and I have absolutely no criticism of them for this at all, and would probably do it myself if I were them. What they are is people seeking a better life in another country. They are migrants. And it's very important to use accurate terms in discussing it. And I think that the, the attempt to make out that people who have, in many cases, paid large sums of money to criminal people smugglers to obtain illegal immigration into countries which have legal requirements for entry uh, is dangerously misleading and propagandist. There is nothing in the Gospels which says that you should favor the rule breaker over the person who keeps the rule, which is what these people invariably are. There is nothing in the Gospel which says you should favor the person who misrepresents his conditions in order to get an advantage over somebody else who's been honest. And there is also nothing in the Gospels which says that you should commit suicide with your society, which is not yours, which you inherited from your forebears, and which you are obliged to hand on in good condition to those who come after you, uh, because of an emotional spasm uh, <laughs> inflicted on you by moralizing the not moral liberals most of whom wouldn't ever dream of having one of these refugees in their own home. So that really is my most thorough answer to that, but I saw you had an objection. I didn't want you to feel that I wasn't going to listen to it. What is it? Uh, I, was, I mean, I object to the notion that they're all migrants, but... Well, hang on. No, if you object to it, then you have to explain why. What do you think a refugee is? No, I understand you're saying that they're Good. not Okay, so, so how come any of these people are refugees? Are, are they fleeing from Sweden? <laughs> <laughs> or is it Germany that they're fleeing from? I'm trying to work out where it is they're fleeing from well, that's brought them here as refugees when they arrived in the There are lots of people that aren't accepted into Sweden or Germany. Well, does it make them refugees? Well, if they don't. Where did they come from when they were rejected? Turkey. I mean, I know Turkey has its faults, but they're not being persecuted. Except they're also migrants. Okay. Right, okay, well that's, that's the point, that is, that either they're refugees or they're migrants. The two words are completely different. Agree, agree. Okay, they're as they're, they're, they're different as, as, as wombat and squirrel. They mean different things. <laughs> they shouldn't be used interchangeably. Oh, I, wasn't, I was talking about refugees, but if... You were? But, yes, I was. But there aren't any refugees here. There are no refugees. Not currently, no, as far as I may, There may be people who have applied for the legal side who come from from oppressive countries such as China or Bahrain or Saudi Arabia, I don't know. But they are not the people we're talking about. Do you think there are no Syrian refugees that apply to Denmark? Sorry? Do you think there are no Syrian refugees that apply to Denmark? Well, if they, why would they apply to Denmark? Because it's nowhere near Syria. The, the, the people who have, who, have, who, have, who have left Syria, uh, and again, there are, there are arguments about whether all of them are refugees, but that's a separate question, which I think this, wasn't, this isn't even discussed. But they, didn't, they, they, they have not applied to come to Denmark from Syria. Yeah. My name is uh, Kimbaya Justin. I can uh, compliment you by saying that uh, we had one uh, Somali refugee in, uh, in Europe. She's called Izzy Ali. She had to leave Europe because she can't be here as a real refugee critical of Islam. And you're in, uh, in, in danger of being killed. We have a new one in Denmark called Sarah Omar. Uh, a little beautiful Arab lady, or Kurdish, sorry. She lives undercover. She's uh, protected by the police. 
that's a real refugee because she's critical of Islam, but they live undercover. By the way, the only ones who oppose Islam in our part of the world are little, tiny little ladies, not not many. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. And a few exceptions. But my question was, I, I get, I get your point. point. Yes. <laughs> so, so most of those so-called refugees are here to improve their lifestyle. And, and I good, good blame them. Anyways, my, my question was, um, you you see materialism as a big challenge or problem. But the, the influx of many people who can't or won't contribute, call them refugees or migrants, I would prefer the, latter, uh, the, the last uh, term, but they will uh, challenge our materialistic way of life. They will sort of follow the welfare society. Well, hang so, on. You, that, that's, uh, this is, uh, I must object to like this, yeah. because in, in my experience, mm -hmm. uh, the great majority of people who come uh, to our country from particularly from poorer parts of the world, mm. come to work and work extremely hard. Yeah. And, they, and they, they contribute to the, to, to the economy. And I think I, mm. I, I will never take part in any suggestion that they, they, that they come for any other purpose. There may be people oh. who come and who take advantage of the wealth system. I'm not saying that they're not. But I don't think it's why most people come. I think they do come to work. I think give them the, the problem here is that our uh, minimum wage is so high. Yeah, I it's understand. very difficult to, to actually work if you want to. And uh, mm -hmm. about the serum refugees, I think it's like 8 or 10% of the women who, who start working here. And the labor participation in the rate is 75 for average thing. So it's a quite a challenge. But anyways, what, what you should, my question would be, so if this sort of limits the, the future of the welfare state, whether it's because they don't want to work or we don't encourage them to, do you think that the, there will be some sort of uh, revolution, some sort of movement among the people born here because they see the welfare state crumbling, which is happening at a fast pace, at least in Sweden, and to a certain degree here, and, and in Britain as well? I don't know. Is that it? But that's that, that, that that's it. Like that stuff. <laughs> right. um, what I was living in the Soviet Union in 1990. And 1991, then in the Russian Federation afterwards, and saw the collapse of the USSR, which was, although not recognizably in a Western sense, but was an elaborate welfare state by its own standards. And it didn't collapse by anybody ever saying, uh, we're winding it up, we're not having a welfare state anymore. It seemed to collapse through catastrophe. Uh, the, the institutions <coughs> simply ceased to operate, the hospitals didn't have uh, any drugs or any, any clean needles uh, or increasingly any staff they weren't clean enough to use. The, the, the pensions that were paid were worthless because the, the money had been so much devalued. And so the whole thing was wiped away by catastrophe. And one of the fascinating things about catastrophe uh, is that people survive it. And they live their lives after it. They're still, they still have the same names. Uh, and they still live in somewhere which is normally the same country, but they live their lives as ghosts of their former selves. And I'm haunted by this, having seen it, uh, that it could happen to us. Uh, that simply because we, we will never take, our political leaders will never take, and we, the people who misguidedly vote for them, something I no, no longer do in haven't had years, but the people will never take the decisions necessary to sustain a welfare state within affordable limits. And so in the end, they will bring upon themselves the catastrophe, which will abolish it. Nobody will ever say it's been abolished. It will continue formally to exist. The pensions will continue to be paid. They won't buy you anything. Uh, the hospitals will still stand. Uh, but they will not be what they were. And that is what will happen. Uh, it's, uh, it, 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 people can't do anything about it unless they reject the political the type of political leadership which which will not resolve these things. And it is, I'm afraid, in the nature of universal suffrage democracy, that it gives the power in society to the ill-educated and the uninformed. Mm -hmm. And the ill-educated and the uninformed will never, ever, ever, ever vote against one vote. Mm -hmm. And so they will, in the end, vote for catastrophe. And that, I'm afraid, is, is, is what faces us. And, and it is, uh, I, I will say to you again, because it's so important, catastrophes <laughs> do happen. They are not just in the movies. They do happen. They happen to people. I've seen the middle classes of Moscow standing by the side of the road, selling their personal possessions for bread. 
And these were people who six months before had no idea what was going to happen to them, were professionals working in, in, in important jobs, who now were, were selling their furniture and their shoes so they could feed their children. And this happened before our eyes, and most of us didn't even notice it. Yes, and uh, my question is a little similar to, to the one um, from over here. My name is Christian. Um, this pessimism of yours that are very, very, very intense. <laughs> um, again, if, if you look to Eastern Europe, if you look to, to not, not just Poland, but Czechia, Hungary, the Visegrad countries that, in my opinion, actually tries to make a systematic political attempt for defending the, 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 the Christian culture, the, 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 the way of living, not, not letting the same, uh, not letting them into this, this kind of disaster that, that, that have happened to Western Europe. I think that this is what do inspire people also in Western Europe. And maybe, well, if you want to be a little, just a little hopeful, um, don't you think that, that there might be some small hope <laughs> that this inspiration can grow? Well, obviously, most of you know. <laughs> It's being so pessimistic keeps me cheerful. I, I keep telling you, I, I don't get any unpleasant surprises. I, by all means, place your hopes in, in the Czech Republic or, or goodness, uh, Hungary if you want to, um, but you won't find me at your side. And if you're right and I'm wrong, then that's a pleasant surprise for me. And if you're wrong and I'm right, I don't get an unpleasant surprise, but you do. It seems to me to be pretty easy to work out which of those is the better position to be having. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, can you sort better? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, um, thank you for coming, uh, Mr. Hitchens. Thank you. It's, uh, 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 it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, actually, um, we're not all uh, atheists here. I, I'm actually uh, a Christian and a philosopher, so. Um, <laughs> Uh, that aside, my question is, uh, what's your advice for the church in England and as well as in, in Denmark, assuming that there are some like-minded clerks uh, left and, and uh, some Bible-believing uh, congregations? What can we do to improve the situation? But you know that I have to answer, there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. I tried. I, tried. I, I wrestled with the Church of England. Right. The Church of England. Uh, you don't know the Church of England. <laughs> Not the way I know the Church of England. The Church of England has two priceless possessions. It has many others as well. The two priceless possessions are the authorised version of the Bible translated into Shakespearean English in 1611, and the Book of Common Prayer, originally written in 1549 and slightly revised in 1662. <laughs> the most beautiful expressions of faith and scripture in the English language or possibly in any language. The Church of England resolutely refuses to use either of them. It uses instead a Bible apparently written by stupid children. <laughs> a prayer book composed by the sort of people who, who, who write advertising. <laughs> and it's uh, it's the hymns which it used to sing. It's done the same thing. With. If ever it gets a chance to wreck and despoil a beautiful building, it does that too. And it is the enemy of its own heritage. And if you try and stop it, uh, it turns on you. And this isn't just a matter of aesthetics. Many years ago, when I was still I wouldn't say an optimist, because I've never been one of those, but when I still was totally devoted to pessimism. That's the source, the source of all happiness, for which I am. I, I tried to, to campaign for the Church of England to re-adopt its ancient liturgy. And I began this by making a survey of churches around my home town of Oxford. 
And I remember going to one, a very beautiful church uh, called uh, Dorchester Abbey, not far from Oxford, and inquiring of a member of the clergy there, a large man, very wide, and, and, and quite well developed in the front of the area as well, uh, in his clerical robes. I said, I can't see anything on the door. Can you tell me, do you use the Book of Common Prayer, the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, here at Dorchester Abbey at all? And he looked at me, long level look. And he said, I know what you're up to. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, I hate, say it like that, I hate Cranmer's theology of penitence. What he meant was he didn't just dislike the book because of the language, and he disliked it because of the strength, the the high octane power of the actual religion. In the same week, I had a completely irrelevant experience, but similar in a way, which I will tell you in case any of you ever experienced British Railways, uh, which I was standing on the platform of Oxford Station one morning when the trains had been unusually chaotic, late, disrupted, and bad. And there was an enormous member of the railway staff standing next to me, about seven feet tall, and I said something along the lines of, Trains haven't been very good today, have they? And he gave me that level stare. And he said, the trouble with people like you, he said, is that you think the railways are run for your benefit. <laughs> 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 and at that moment, I knew that, of course, I had been one of those people. I had thought that. And from ever afterwards, I never have. I've always known they're not run for my benefit. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was completely irrelevant, but I couldn't do it. Thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Oscar, Mr. Hitchens. Thank you for the fine speech. Um, my uh, question may be a bit off topic, but I would like your view on one of the great concerns of my own, apart from the things you mentioned, which is a concern that has grown through my lifetime when I've seen the masses, massive advances in technology, uh, through the use of smartphones and computers. Mm. I remember my own childhood being outside playing and when I see young children today, before they are even able to speak, they are handling an <coughs> iPad. Uh, what are your views of these uh, components which are entering our lives, making our lives more selfish, alienating uh, men from women, and how are they related to the downfall of our Western civilization, if they are. Uh, I would like to hear your views on those. Mm. When I wrote my first book, The Abolition of Britain, which I completed in 1999, I put in it a chapter about television, which at that time I thought was one of the principal threats to civilization. I mean, personal here, because it's, you know, I'm, my children are more or less grown now, and it's not, it, it, it doesn't, it's not the hostage to fortune it would have been before. My wife and I decided from the start that we would keep our children away from television as much as possible, because we thought that it was a terrible danger to the young mind. We couldn't quite, I tried to put it into words that we couldn't quite work out exactly what it was that repelled us so much about it. My most fundamental criticism is that it seemed to me to destroy the individual imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it is my view that it is in, in the imagination that all moral questions are considered and resolved. Mm -hmm. That if you have no imagination of your own, that you can't do so. It is also in the imagination that people learn not to conform with what is wicked, where they can think of the alternatives to what they're being asked to do and decide sometimes either to do something else or not to do what they're being asked to do. I think it's absolutely essential that people have imaginations if they're going to have that very precious gift of civil courage without which no <coughs> proper free society can survive. So I hated television children and we did actually manage to <coughs> impose this rule of keeping them away from it and I'm very pleased that we did. 
because the second part of this is that I believe that reading is a great gift. And again, for the same reason, because of the enormous stimulus it gives to the imagination. In fact, I don't believe that an imagination can really grow uh, without reading. It's the muscles of, of the mind that are hugely increased by it. So that, I thought then, was the threat. The point that you now make about smartphones and iPads and all the other devices is in many ways the same point, only a much, much more dangerous one. Because these things steal away even more than television did. They're ever present. They're almost impossible for a, even, even for a strong-minded and strong-willed parent to control uh, once they're available. The pressure on everyone to have them is, is almost totalitarian. And I mentioned in my opening remarks all this Huxley's Brave New World. Because I think that, it, that I, I'm a great admirer of George Orwell, and I, 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 I do think that his, his writing is immensely powerful, but 1984 is as nothing compared to the brilliance of Brave New World as a, as a warning of what we face and of this, the, the voluntary surrender of our minds which is going on. And I, I completely agree with you, these things are terrible. I don't know what a young parent now can do to combat it. But I absolutely applaud any parent who tries to do so. And if you do try and combat it, do not be discouraged. Uh, do not be jeered, or sneered, or pressured, or, or conformed out of your resolve, because what you will be doing is something immensely valuable, and others should follow your example. We got a lot of mockery and sneers from our co-evils when we said we were not going to do this thing of letting them watch television. Uh, and we just had to endure them. We were that guy, we were troublemakers, so that had not been from the start, so it was easy. But not everybody finds it as easy as we uh, If you can fight it, do. But I, and, and be sure when you do that you're not just doing something eccentric uh, individual and futile, but you are doing something immensely valuable. If that's any help, I hope it is. <laughs> so, Mr. Hitchens, uh, thank you very much for a very thoughtful uh, read. Uh, I'm William, and um, every time I hear someone use like a neo or new as a prefix, it's typically meant in a slight polemic way. Um, Neocon, new liberalism, new religious, um, even atheism. Um, said, well, new atheism, two places tonight, and um, so we're talking about wombats and squirrels, sort of what makes the new, what makes the new, is it that it's on YouTube, is it that it's sort of in the offensive, what's the difference, and from sort of a believer's point of view, would you prefer that the atheists were on the offensive, that you got to sort of stand up for your beliefs and get actively debate them? Uh, on the, the very last point first, certainly someone of my character, I'm not, I, I, the funniest thing anyone ever writes about me or says about me, and they do say the kinds of things about me, but, is that I'm a devout Christian. I, it, it's so untrue, it's almost unbelievable. I'm nothing of the kind, I'm an ordinary backsliding human being who struggles uh, to, to continue with, it, with anything approaching it, the Christian life, I'm much happier attacking uh, <coughs> atheists and defending the faith against them than I am trying to engage in any kind of theological defense of the Christian religion itself. That's just a personal characteristic. On the question of Neo, <coughs> this isn't universal, <coughs> but I think one of the things which is going on is this, and as an ex- <coughs> Trotskyist of some years standing. I feel I know quite a lot about it. When the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet regime collapsed and the Warsaw Pact vanished, far from being defeated, the revolutionary left in the Western world was hugely strengthened. The fall of the Berlin Wall released the Marxist left from a terrible constraint on it. And that constraint was that it was always associated with treachery 
and it was also always associated with the catastrophic failure of Soviet economic plan. The end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the association between Moscow and Marxism and Leninism, and we stopped at that. But where do you think all the Marxist Leninists who were at university with me in the late 1960s and early 1970s got to? And how many of them did what I did and became reactionary Christians? Well, the answer to the first question is they're all over the place. And the answer to the second question is not very many. For instance, I was discussing earlier on this evening the number of Anthony Blair's cabinet members who had been in their student years and later in some cases, much later, members of Marxist Leninist organizations. Uh, I know of five, uh, including Blair himself, who recently revealed that he had been a member of the Trotskyist organization. He kept it up all the time he was in government. I do not believe that they are isolated or unique. Throughout the establishment of all the Western countries, a huge number of people trained in Marxist thought and taking more or less the Gramscian position, which is that the cultural revolution, the establishment of cultural hegemony, by the left, the destruction, <coughs> particularly of Christianity and of everything that goes with it, precedes the social and economic revolution. <coughs> that these people exist all around us, that they call themselves all kinds of names, but in fact they are revolutionaries reborn. The revolution no longer desires to capture the post office and the barracks and the railway station. These are old-fashioned targets. The revolution wishes to capture the television studio, the newspaper office, the school, the university, and ultimately the legal system and everything else that goes with it. The revolution also operates through the European Union which is, in my view, more or less a Euro-communist project. <laughs> and these neo-terms are a way that seems to me in disguising the fact that we actually still have among us probably more prevalent than any time since, uh, since the 1930s serious currents of revolutionary thought within our societies, uh, which prefer not to name themselves directly. It's just another aspect of it. I, it I'm being a bit opportunistic in using your question to say something I would probably find an excuse to say, anyway, <laughs> but I think it is more or less correct. Yeah. I think you are a little too easy off the hook uh, to well, answer the, <laughs> the question of my grandchild and uh, our Christian philosopher uh, here. Um, I take it that the, that the uh, definition of migrant and uh, refugees are obsolete. Okay. But now well, they are here. So they're obsolete. I said that the migrant was a different thing from that. But they are here. I didn't say they were, but that's the no. question we do. So, we're so not arguing about whether, whether they're here. Have, have to find our terms, we're arguing about what their actual position is and how they can be yeah. truth, truthfully described. Okay, I, I, say, okay. I take it for the, for the sake of the argument, I take that. Uh, that well, not to say the argument, it's either the case or it's not the case. You, if, if we're going to argue, you have to either accept my premise my question, or you have to rebut it. My question just go around. remains, what should we do about it? What should we do about it? Uh, uh, okay. I've been, uh, in my professional life, I've had a chair in, uh, in global theology and missionary. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, mission. That's uh, Christian virtue. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Well, it depends what you mean by it, really. I don't, Convert those I don't know what it means in practice. Convert those pastors. <laughs> Sorry? Convert those pastors. <laughs> uh, well, it's a which I can only reply good luck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not something I well, propose well, to well, attempt there tonight. Are some <laughs> But so it was a rather remarkable swerve from one thing to another, but I, I whatever you want. But please, answer. What's but what's the, what am I answering? What's should, do I think I should rush out and try and convert Muslims to Christianity? Personally, it's not a thing I have any taste for. I, if, you want to, if you want to do it, I, I, I'm not standing in your way. <laughs>
Can I come into so that? There's another question and answer it. Like, I, I, I don't, converting Muslims is, is fraught with difficulty because of the, their religion's view of those who leave it, as you must know. I'd like to come to your defense, actually. The thing mm -hmm. about Denmark, I love Denmark, even though I'm not really a Dane. We tend to think long term about things such as sustainability and quite I'm studying, I mean, uh, <laughs> <media energy. laughs> right? You think into 2050, right? But when it comes to whether uh, mass immigration and with integration being a failed project in the past, largely in Denmark, we don't seem to think long term about integration and, and immigration. I mean, how will it, how will the the demographic landscape of Denmark look in 2050? Right? Are, are those uh, questions we're asking ourselves? And I, I think you cannot convert everybody. I mean, as I said, I'm I'm a utter anomaly, and especially when when we have this much. Uh, atheism in Denmark and secularism and lack of Christian virtues, it's, it's impossible to have converting It's uh, people. very interesting with the debate among yes. the audience, but it's there are many, many questions. So. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, well, we have a break. Would you have a very short comment on that? No. Okay. Of course, I know the difference is. No, I Oh, question? Yeah. Uh, uh, there's something uh, strangely comforting about having someone uh, confirm your private fears about the future, even though you don't give us much hope. Um, I read a few of your books, and I think um, what um, you're, you're very right about civilization. You describe civilization as a fragile thing, uh, how you were in Mogadishu, and you describe how everything is absolutely chaotic and it's dangerous to be out of night, and um, how you have seen pictures of what it was like just 20 years before you were there, and it was a civilized place. And um, you watched also about Moscow, how quickly civilization can crumble. And um, I think that struck a deep chord with me, um, because I understood that immediately when I was 14 and for the first time read The Lord of the Flies, which describes civilization as this very thin ice. And underneath the ice is just really um, a chaotic soup, you know, and you, if you fall into that, you just drown. Um, and you also talk about music, um, radio music, pop music, rock and roll, Mick Jagger, that sort of stuff. And um, every time you turn on the radio in Denmark, all you get is that. You have a hundred different channels, all you get is pop music and rock and roll from the 60s. And the message that music always sends is, you should just follow your basis desires. You should just do whatever you like. Um, it, is, it is not the music that grew out of Western civilization. Um, I personally, uh, my, my favorite composer is Handel. Um, I'm particularly fond of the oratory. Theodora, I don't know if you know it. It's not yeah. very well known. I've but heard it. But you did? Not, not often. No. Oh, really? Um, because there's a very... Uh, a very uh, strong area by Irene, who is some sort of priestess, I think, uh, where she sings, Bane of virtue, nurse of passion, soother of vile inclinations, such as prosperity, by me. So she describes prosperity as the bane of everything that is good. And I think that's a little bit of something you said also, that what is really our decline in the West is our own prosperity. So, um, I, I don't want to uh, force you into hoping. <laughs> but I think perhaps if our civilization completely crumbles to dust, which I think it probably will, then perhaps out of the complete destruction of our prosperity, something may grow. I more comment than a question. Yeah, it may, well, I don't want to be there at the time. <laughs> you probably will be. Or I will yeah, be. Yeah, that's the trouble. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Do, do, are you expecting an answer or are you just <coughs> saying? It's more of a comment, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, my name is Stephen. I'm uh, from here. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, those new things are not so bad because I, I, I learned about your, your about you on uh, YouTube 
videos on my studies of Islam, I, uh, you popped up as a good, with good debates, and they were very interesting, and that's why I'm here today. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, if you have to, uh, to, to uh, try to convert a Muslim or to learn about Islam, you have to dig into the core of what it's all about, and then you have to uh, study uh, uh, Muhammad as uh, the rough and the bad neighbor he slaughtered and killed and was a, rough, uh, a, a, a bad neighbor, and that's how he acquired success. Yeah. And uh, this knowledge uh, uh, is very simple to, to, to acquire, but uh, all, all uh, uh, the, the, the public discussion, uh, discussions here and in Western Europe, they just take part on, on the surface. Uh, all the, uh, the, the, the interviewers and most politicians, they haven't studied uh, Islam at all. They don't know what they, what they are talking about. They don't ask uh, really uh, questions. Uh, uh, the, the question never comes up, uh, what is you at first, are you a, 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 a Dane or are you a Muslim? That question never comes up. <laughs> can, can you give, give us an idea how we can uh, get all this public, uh, all the public uh, uh, persons who, who, who run the society, how, how to, they could dig into what Islam is, then they will probably... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't say that I can give you any idea as to how to do that, but I do feel that everybody with any self-respect should resist the attacks made on critics of Islam which accuse them of something called Islamophobia. Uh, I think that it's Islam, like any religious proposition, is also a political proposition. If you don't believe in it yourself, you are entitled uh, to criticize its arguments, its scriptures, its precepts. In my view, you should do so in the most fair and rational and courteous way that you can, because I don't think that anything else will make progress. But I think a lot of the problem arises because of this attempt to claim that any resistance to or objection to Islam is based on racial prejudice, which is fundamentally the root of the false term Islamophobia. And that is a thing that I would resist first of all. I have argued with Muslims directly quite a lot about their faith, and I have never found one who has been in any way offended or upset to be challenged. Uh, and I also tended to feel that the, the, the fact that they knew that I was myself a member of, of one of the Abrahamic faiths made the position far better because there was some mutual respect which otherwise there wouldn't be. And again, I commend that. I'm not sure about your approach uh, to it. I suspect you know more about the Quran than I do, and I, I, I bow to that knowledge. I'm not sure about your approach being particularly productive, but I do think you're quite right that most people in public life know very little about Islam and should endeavor to know more. Uh, but there's another point about this, which is that the political left shames itself day after day after day by aligning itself with faith whose precepts are mostly utterly opposed to everything the left claims to believe in. And I think they, they really need to be very heavily criticized about that, especially since so many of them are dominant in in media organizations and in education that this point should be relentlessly made. As for the rest, I say, in argument with people about subjects such as religion, which are often very close to their hearts and have a great deal to do with their, their, their childhood, their upbringing, their respect for their parents, their, and a lot of very things which are very, very deep inside them, courtesy and reason above all things, and not hostility, are more likely to change my Yes, hello, thank you for coming, Mr. Rittens. My name you. is Herman Christensen. Uh, your views on Brexit and the press 
handling of that historic event. <coughs> Please elaborate. <laughs> 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 Brexit, by the way, is a term you've just forced me to do it. I never use. It always makes me think of an unpleasant laxative. <laughs> uh, and I don't. I I did not support the referendum. I hate referenda, I think they're unconstitutional in British terms. I took no part in the campaign. I am by no means sure that the outcome of what's happened is going to be good. I am puzzled by what happened in British politics uh, during the campaign. I had for many, many years believed that my country should leave the European Union. And I found that almost nobody I knew in the media or in politics shared my view. Suddenly, within a few days of the referendum being proclaimed, dozens of people who I had previously never known to have any strong feelings about it at all had appeared and started saying, oh, no, 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 we must leave. And we must all vote to leave. And I still don't understand it. Uh, there were newspapers which, to my certain knowledge, had not in 20 years ever written a leading article saying that we should leave, suddenly very, very actively campaigned to leave. Where did it come from? I just don't know. The problem with a country such as ours is that it's the only way it could have left the European Union sensibly would have been to have elected a political party with a parliamentary majority with a program of leaving the European Union and a clear understanding of why and how it was to be done. What we did was we held a referendum, and at the end of it, the people who were responsible for the, for the vote to leave vanished. Uh, they formed no organization. They formed no government. There was no government which existed to support what they did. They never elaborated on how they were going to do it or why. We were left with the ridiculous position of the British government composed almost entirely of people who all their political lives had supported British membership of the European <coughs> Union <coughs> through the measures to take us out of it. That is where we are. Mm -hmm. uh, it can only end unhappily. My own view is that in the end it will, it will have to be compromised. Uh, I have said from the start that uh, we will move as a country from having been half in the European Union, which we were before to be half out of it, <laughs> which we will be in the future. We will not shake ourselves entirely clearly. Uh, we will possibly end up, and it might be the most sensible compromise available, somewhere near where Norway now is. Uh, but an absolute total departure, particularly from the single market, with the effect that this would have on our dealings with third countries, notably the Republic of Ireland, uh, is very worrying indeed. And as I say, I do not think that most of those who got involved in this campaign realized what it was they were doing or even now really understand what it, what it is that they are doing. And that's never a good recipe for a good outcome. I hope that makes some sort of sense to you. It makes some sort of sense to me. But it doesn't stop me being the best. <laughs> Two questions left. Ms. you and last. You have the last one. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't introduce myself. No, so no, it's wonderful to see you again. Sensing sarcasm, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so I just had another question, now only about migrants. Um, and it kind of, in this exchange with this gentleman, um, you seem to be suggesting that we shouldn't reject migrants solely because they're Muslim. That, correct? Well, you can't, I would, that would not be a reason to say that, that, Agreed. Would, to say totally that Trump, yeah. you could not come into a country. Yeah, yeah right. So Islam's not so really... Donald Trump thinking. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Yes, we, we do agree. Um, and then you also alluded to the fact that um, economic migrants often work hard and can be good for the economy long term. Sure. So why not accept economic migrants? And I anticipate that your answer will be because they destroyed the cultural foundation of Christianity and... Yeah. Well, do, do you want to answer my question, or do you want me to well, answer my, it? Well, my, <laughs> my quick follow-up question is, so as somebody who, um, I guess, hasn't grown up with as strict Christian frameworks, why can't it be more of an abstract concept of love? Like, why does it have to be this very specific, like, structured? Why can't it be a more abstract love? And if 
you don't love these new migrants, how can you expect them to love in the spirit of Christianity? Okay, well, um, right. Our first question, the problem about immigration is not whether it takes place at all. Uh, almost all countries will at some time uh, in their existences encourage some level of immigration. I could tell it's not, I, I, I can't now, but it, I, I, there is a wonderful story I could tell you about immigration is in Japan, which illustrates this, but a country which resists migration more than most. But everybody has to do it. The question is, there is a question of quantity. And what, when I used to study dialectic and materialism, we used to call the transformation of quantity into quality. The, there is a point at which migration becomes so large that integration of migrants becomes difficult or impossible. And integration is important both for the migrants so that they can become fully functioning members of the society they've joined and for that society uh, so that they can accept them. And it, it is in the failure to integrate that mass immigration has done so much damage. And it is mass immigration that we're talking about. The numbers who were coming into Europe from the Middle East during the Angular Merkel period uh, were astonishing and unprecedented. The numbers which, I don't know the figures for Denmark, so I won't talk about it, but the numbers which have been coming into Britain since more or less the beginning of the new Labour government in the late 1990s are unprecedented by any standards. They're huge and impossible to integrate. So there is a simple question here of practicality. It's not a question of saying, no, we can't let anybody in. It's a question of saying, we have a limit, we decide what it is. Okay, so now I can't take another one from you because I've now got to ask you a question about, about love. Um, I'm not a theologian and don't claim to be. The point about the religious approach to all these matters is that fundamentally it states that the law is not made by us out of our own minds and preferences law is made and justice comes from elsewhere and we cannot alter it. And we are obliged, as a result, quite often, to do things which we would not ourselves choose to do and not to do things which we wish to do. Uh, love also does not mean uh, soppy inability to distinguish between good and bad. Uh, or a desire to make oneself look good in the eyes of others uh, by appearing to be sympathetic to their plight while forgetting the plight of others. And this question of immigration it is almost invariably in those countries which encourage mass immigration, it is almost invariably the urban poor who are given no say in the matter, who have most to adapt their lives to cope with change. You have to, as I said in my introductory remarks, to accept the pressure on employment, the downward pressure on wages, uh, the, 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 the increasing pressure on all welfare services, schools, hospitals, public transport, <coughs> housing, uh, while uh, the usually middle class prosperous people who seek to gain moral advantage by posing as generous uh, do not experience uh, the generosity which they wish to inflict upon others. If that is love, then it's not one that I would recognize. It is self-indulgence dressed up as love. And here is the problem. So much of what passes for goodness in modern society, ostentatious donation to charity, ostentatious adherence to good causes, is not actually the doing of good. It is the making of ourselves to look good, which is not the same. Yeah. Well, uh, I have a rather difficult question for oh, you. No. <laughs> I believe so. Uh, we share, I believe, a common past politically. Where I didn't see you. <laughs> I didn't see you around. <laughs> I didn't see you. Maybe it was disguised. Uh, but I don't think it's a good idea to drop uh, every uh, last vestige of Marxism. I think we need this, uh, an element of Marxist analysis to understand what is happening 
science of science. And you can you can find that to people doing all kinds of dumb things. Why do they destroy this? Why do they do that? <clears throat> but they have a reason. They have material reasons for acting the way they do. They are people who make money, make careers, gain power by leading us astray. I mean, this this whole uh, human rights, as they have invented as a uh, to replicate or to 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 dis, uh, to to use instead of Marxism or socialism, they have uh, human rights and then they have a uh, green uh, green transformation where um, people base their power and their income on on these ideologies. What would happen if we we uh, dropped immigration? There would be tens of thousands of people in Denmark without a job. Those who make a living integrating them, they're those who don't integrate. Write the papers and think up various kinds of rationales to 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 convince people that this is the way it must be. Who controls the biggest part of the economy? Not the capitalists. The bureaucrats, the public sector, is the biggest part of the economy now. So whoever can put his hand on the, the public sector is the ruling class. I think we need a bit of that in our analysis. Mm -hmm. oh. I have never uh, wholly abandoned the Marxist analysis. Good. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I find it, I'm always amazed by watching people who have never had a Marxist analysis say, trying to make sense of it. And they, they can't. I think it's actually one of the most useful tools I've ever had. What I've abandoned is the homicidal Bolshevism, uh, which believed that I could hack my way over other people's corpses uh, to power for the good of humanity. That, that I have, I think, almost completely abandoned. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they came from Twitch. Don't be around while I'm suffering it. But yeah, I don't, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with that, and, uh, and a lot of people would benefit from it. Uh, in fact, I would say that being an ex Trotskyist is probably one of the best educations anybody can have, but make sure you're an ex. <laughs> 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 <laughs>